I'm Park Howell, and welcome to the Business of Story, where I consult, teach, coach, and speak on the applied science and bewitchery of brand and business storytelling, so that you can clarify your story to amplify your impact and simplify your life. I thought it was just a stupid picture of a pig in the ocean. But after hearing that story, I had to have it. Now I wasn't just buying a picture. I was buying a story. Story literally made the picture worth more money to me. That's what businesses are about. People buy brands. People buy stories much more than anything else. I work with a lot of big enterprise companies, but let's just say I always tell folks, drop the PowerPoint, close your laptops, start with your story. If you want people to get engaged and you want people to act, you have to tell them an emotionally powerful story. That's with great characters, it's with uncertain outcomes, and it's with high stakes and drama. All business strategy is a story. No, you're not dreaming. You're not winning a beautiful new car on Let's Make a Deal. Nor have I turned my show into a Zen sound bath. You're listening to Transitions, an improvised piece by harpist, branding expert, professor, author, and sustainable storyteller, Alicia DeMesa. Alicia combines her classical music training, branding expertise, and communication skill through her work at the Mesa Training and Advisory to help leaders of purpose-driven brands create a greater impact in the world. She is a professor of communications and storytelling for the ASU School of Sustainability graduate programs in sustainability leadership. Alicia also teaches marketing and entrepreneurship for undergraduates at Benedictine University in Mesa, Arizona, and is pursuing a human and social dimensions of science and technology PhD from ASU School for the Future of Innovation in Society. On today's show, you will learn about the power of improvisation in your own life, even if you're not a musician. We explore what Aristotle called the three proofs of ethos, logos, and pathos, and why these appeals are important in your storytelling. And you'll learn how to bring more impact to your purpose-driven brand, right now on The Business of Story. Alicia, welcome to the show. Thank you. Now, that was a beautiful piece that you sent me to launch today's episode. Can you tell us a little bit, what, what's it called and what's happening there? Yeah, great, great question. So first of all, it's called Transformation. That was a, a CD that I recorded actually several years ago now. And at the time, the, the CD title was Sattva. And I recorded that music as an in-the-moment improvisational. I went into a recording studio with an idea of how do I want to approach different perspectives. And so what that means is different perspectives on feelings, physical state, mental state, emotional states, even spiritual states. And if I set that intent for what I want, what kind of a musical story comes out from that in the moment? through the fingers as me being more of a channel for the music versus I'm playing something off of a page, which I really wasn't. It was all improvisation and in the moment. So that is a very brief snippet from a larger album that was recorded that way. So you literally just sat down to your harp and felt this and channeled this emotion through and what you were feeling and trying to communicate, you then transferred through the strings of your harp. I did. I, I'm a really big believer that musicians in particular, but I mean, you could say this about writers, you could say this about filmmakers, about artists, that we can be, and some people are very deliberately channels from something that is just higher than us, you know, however you want to define that, whether it's a, a higher purpose, a higher being, but there's this higher message that can be, I don't think any of us really understand rationally that can be channeled in through the person as being the instrument. And so it it always sort of of takes me back to that that prayer by St. Francis of Assisi, you know, God, let me be an instrument of thy peace. 
and so intent in this case is is a big part of setting you know what what comes through in terms of that actual music through the fingers and how long have you been playing the harp well without completely giving away with my age i was 10 when i started playing and it was my third instrument, not that I was any child prodigy by any means. I was an average pianist. I was a very average violinist. I was very fortunate that my grandmother, uh, my grandparents raised me, so they were supportive in terms of giving me musical outlets, but they didn't have the financial means to give me private outlets. So I did everything through the public schools, and I was very fortunate that I went to a school in Mesa, Arizona that allowed me to do a public harp program for a token amount of money where I had a harp, I had lessons, and I started when I was 10, and I went all the way through Arizona State University many years later, got a full ride for symphonic playing with the harp, and that's what introduced me. It was all about a music teacher believing in me and saying, would you like to play a harp? And introduce me to it. Well, you obviously have had this love of music as a very young girl, and you had a few trials. You said you weren't so great at the first two instruments, but you persevered. What? <laughs> well, you know, that would crush a lot of people, especially at that young, impressionable age. What made you keep pursuing and then ultimately moving over to the harp? You know, that's a great question. And I get asked that a lot in terms of why harp. And I, almost, and I always sort of say harp chose me in a lot of senses. I, I don't have an exact answer to that other than the love of music. So even though that I wasn't really great at it, and, and I think even at the age, you know, when I was younger with playing the harp, I would never have claimed to be some harp prodigy by any stretch of the imagination. I just knew I loved it. I loved the music. I loved what was coming through. And something, again, something a little higher than myself was keeping me to pursuing that and practicing that. And, and, just, and, and I will put it even more generally in saying of being willing to take the next step, even with a lot of trepidation in, in a lot of cases. Well, your life and my life parallel quite a bit because I studied music at a very young age, played the piano, was never a great piano player. And in fact, I was mortified to actually have to play in front of people. And my wife, Michelle, will say, wait a minute, you can get up in front of 5,000 people and talk about storytelling, but you can't play for the five people sitting in our living room right now. And I go, <laughs> exactly. So you, like me, we both got degrees in music. You are a classically trained harpist. I studied music composition and theory, which I was just, and still to this day, absolutely fascinated with. But we both also took a branding, advertising, marketing approach. In my case, I knew I was never going to make a dime in music. So I figured, well, I could apply that in the arts commerce world of advertising and marketing. How about you? Did you think that you would be you know, a, a professional harpist or how did you find branding or how did it find you? Yeah, well, let's back up and say I wasn't a music major. I was a political science major with a French literature minor and a full ride for music. Now, how that all came to be was mostly because I could play with symphonies and they needed a symphonic harpist. And so they were willing to give me a full ride in order to fill that slot at the university. So yay, you know situational blessings. <laughs> the power of a niche, right? The power so you... <laughs> of a niche, number one, number <laughs> okay. one. Uh, the power of timing, number two. And so, you know, it, it, it's been an interesting riff in my life because I do love art. I believe in the power of arts for a number of different reasons, everything from social impact to, to just even healing to aesthetics. But the reality of it is, I thought I was going to be a journalist. And so from the age of 14, through really kind of the end of college and my first couple of years out of college, I thought I was going to be a classic old school newspaper writer. I chose poli sci as an undergrad only because someone had actually told me at that time, if you want to be a good journalist, get that as your undergrad and then go do your master's degree in journalism. And so I thought, hey, that sounds like a good idea. But what happened along the way was that I was slowly introduced to international business. I was slowly introduced to different aspects of business that I didn't know about before and never really cared about before. Because again, I thought I was just going to be a journalist. 
So I escaped out of here once I, I, out of here meaning Arizona. I escaped out of Arizona. I had lived here all my life. I wanted something new. And I, I was under this immense illusion, I will say, that there is something greater than what's in the United States, and I want to go experience that. And so I went to Germany, and I stayed there for a little while, and I had all sorts of very interesting experiences over there, including a lot of people who were caught up in the Bosnian conflict at the time. So this was their civil war, and there were a lot of people who were coming as refugees into Germany from Bosnia, where there was you know, civil war and there was just downright genocide going on. And so when I came back to the US, I landed in San Francisco. I ended up marrying, my first husband was a, a Bosnian refugee, and we landed in San Francisco. And I thought, okay, what now? And the first thing I thought was that I'm just going to go get a job because I've been doing that since I was 14 years old and I'm just going to go find something. And so long story short, I ended up through a series of, of temp jobs that landed me. First, I thought I was going to be going to and placed at Condé Nast and I wasn't. I was switched and I was taken into this agency and this agency was called Landor. And they brought me in. A major branding agency. The, the, yeah. So in, in the world of brand identity agencies and in the world of brand development, there's probably, you know, on one hand, the number of major players that you can count and kind of always have been. And so Landor back in the day and still is one of the, the global branding agencies who deals with developing brands for all the really big brands. And so I was submitted there by the temp agency and I stayed. And that was my introduction to the world of brand, brand identity, et cetera. So when you were submitted by the temp agency, so were you essentially a receptionist of some sort? And then you worked your way up through the branding ranks? Yeah. You know, I was a grunt. I don't even remember actually what, <laughs> what my title was. I mean, receptionist was way too precise. I was, I was a grunt that was put through. And I think they did. It, well, I was told. They, they said, well, you know, you can write. You have a couple languages under you. So I was coming out with, again, French literature as, as a, a minor in school. And then I had just spent time in Germany and learning German over there as well. And so they said, well, you speak languages. Can you help our naming department over here help to evaluate some of these names that we're creating for, you know, these very big brand projects to see what do you think? Is, is this, what do you think about the cultural and the linguistic conflicts or potential conflicts. And these are some of the aspects that actually go into any type of naming, but especially global naming and multinational naming. And so um, I was doing everything from that to doing Photoshop jobs to I'm sure fetching people coffee and throwing things away. I mean, I was a grunt. I was put everywhere until I really found that kind of both they liked me and I liked it in terms of naming. And that's, that was my big in, in terms of the professional side of brand development. Well, so then branding kind of found you like the harp kind of found you. Kind of did. Obviously, yeah. it plays to your strength. So what can you tell us some of the big brands that you worked on at the time to, that you cut your teeth on? Yeah. So I was pretty much thrown in the deep end. I was working with AT&T and Frito-Lay and Procter and & Gamble. And, uh, you know, there were there, Sara Lee. There were, there were a host of different, very large scale brands. Um, some of them were big in terms of like the... the if anybody can remember Lucent Technologies, that was our team who was doing that. Now, it certainly wasn't me. It was a team effort. And, you know, it was, it was learning about, at a very early age, not only the ins and outs of uh, teamwork in terms of bringing in creatives, how to work with them, how to work with freelancers, how to work with a client, how to work with research, for that matter. You know, I mean, I, well, the one thing I will say is that my actual title was naming manager. And no one under, you know, outside of the, the, the walls of Landor, no one understood what that was. So I spent most of my time trying to explain to people what I did for a living. Well, and your mom and dad probably had no idea whatsoever. I, I, exactly. They, yeah, <laughs> naming manager. Really. Who gets paid for naming stuff? Yeah, exactly. I mean, you name your, you name your dog, you name your kid. Shouldn't I be able to do this easily? Well, uh, you know, most people who, anybody who's ever been a part of a name process with especially a large company will find out very quickly there is a lot of money at stake. There are a lot of trademark conflicts and most of the dictionary has already been trademarked. So. Yeah. So 
in your work there then at Landor, when did you start realizing that this was a calling of yours, that you could really have an impact in the world of branding and later we'll, we'll talk about in a bit in the show, brand storytelling for impact in the world? Yeah, I wish I could say it was some big clear epiphany that, aha, I found my calling, but really what I was going with were my strengths. And so I realized I was good at it. I realized I liked it. But I also realized very quickly, really within a few years after landing or going back and forth between San Francisco and New York, that I did not like the agency life. And I did not like being in an airport, you know, really every other weekend. What didn't you like about the agency life? It was really high pace for me. And that part I I liked, you know, because I really kind of like that adrenaline state of I have another assignment and I have this goal and I have this deadline. But what was really difficult for me was just traveling so much. And as much as I love traveling personally, being on the road as a road warrior every week, especially when I was in the New York position, became too much of a toll personally, mentally, emotionally. And, you know, I was really young at the time, so I couldn't really articulate that. It really was me being in a brief moment of a break on a beach in Honolulu that I realized I can't do this. And I, I resigned. I had a lot of people not happy with me. And I got my ticket back to San Francisco and said, what am I going to do with my life? I have no idea. I don't have a job again. I don't know what I'm doing. And I landed over there, moved in with a couple of roommates, and I accidentally found my way into self-employment, which was doing what I do or did for Landor. My first client was Landor because I think I had a couple of clients who were not real happy that I left. And so they sort of, I'm just going to say, suggested to my former employer to, (laughs) to hire me back. And, and so I completed those projects and, and it gave me the confidence to go on my own. And so what I found out was that, you know, I can do this. I can do this for, for other uh, companies. But what was really going on at that point in time was technology in the Bay Area with the first wave of the dot coms. And I was already in love with technology. I was already hand coding by myself websites at home after land or hours to create a social activist page for Bosnian refugees. And that's what I was doing in my spare time. And so the the love for technology was um, always there for me along the way. And that's what gave me sort of a something to go forward with that was exciting. It's like, I wanted to help these new, brave, you know, at the time we call them dot coms, companies who were breaking down walls, who were democratizing technology, who was democratizing business. And let's help them make their way and create better brands. And that's what I did. So are you talking roughly the mid 1990s at this point? Yes. Mid, mid and late, especially late 1990s. And and to close the loop, I guess, on your, your first husband. So in this whole process, apparently then that didn't work out because you said you returned back and, and you, and you found some roommates and you started now the next chapter of your life. Yeah. Yeah. You were still real committed to helping the Bosnians as best you could and taught yourself coding and started taking advantage of what was happening in the tech world at that time. I did. You know, the one thing that I I was realizing at that time, I mean, you have to put yourself back into, for anybody who's old enough to remember the 1990s and what websites look like, Mm -hmm. they were really bad. (laughs) We built some of them. Yep. 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 I know what you mean. (laughs) And, you know, they were visually very cluttered and they were clunky and, and, Yeah. So um, I think what I realized at that time was that this was a very powerful vehicle for communication. This was a very powerful vehicle for storytelling in a way that also needed to be visual as much as it was verbal. And so that was my first aha, and I suppose has been the thread for, for the rest of my career, that it really takes verbal and visual storytelling to make a true impact with people, especially if you want to do it quickly. And especially if you don't want to confuse people, you know, it's the ultimate goal. Right. So let's fast forward a decade or so when you and I got acquainted. And I'm just even trying to remember in my mind when you came to work for us at Park & Co. and helping us in our brand work. So that had to have been, what, roughly about 2010, 2012, something like that? I think it was about 2013, something (laughs) like that. 2013. Yeah. And it was great working with you. And we got along famously because I think of our, our 
collective backgrounds in music. Let me ask you at this point, how do you feel like your training, your persistence in music? Because it's as much of musicianship as it is athleticism to be able to reach the level of expertise that you have, your, your abilities um, playing the harp. How do you see that cross-pollinating with your ability to create, craft, and tell a good brand story on behalf of the company? Well, I'm going to back that up into the music itself. So I think most people have an idea that music happens from a level that you are locked away in a room for several hours at a time, practicing scales, practicing technique. Then you're going to apply that to some type of a piece that you've memorized and you're now going to perform. And it's rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat. And that's how you build up that mastery. And and not to poo-poo anybody who does that and not to poo-poo that process, that was not my process. And so, and may may I underscore that for a second? Because when I was studying composition and theory, I didn't have that kind of dedication of sitting down to the instrument. But I can think of one gentleman in particular, brilliant, brilliant pianist by the name of Dave Deman, and he would spend ten and twelve hours a day in those practice rooms, day yes. in and day out, to achieve that kind of mastery. And you're saying you didn't have to do that. Well, I'm not going to say I didn't have to do that because if I were doing certain types of music, I I would have to do that. Yeah. But I deliberately chose a path that was, again, playing to what interested me and what played to my strengths. So I knew at an early age that I did not want to be playing recital solo on a stage. However, I did truly enjoy that with the symphony and other types of ensembles, including being down under the stage for Broadway musicals and lyric opera theater and those kinds of things. That was a lot of fun. I knew that really fed me and I really enjoyed that. And I think what happened was that I hit a point where the one thing that terrified me the most was to go off of the page, to go off of what is being presented in front of me and have the faith that I can actually play something that is not written on a page. To improvise. So Im- improvisation. Yeah. Now, you know, if you've been trained as a jazz musician, this is probably like, duh, I do. You know, I've been doing this since day two of doing my jazz training. But um, for a classical musician, that's sort of a big deal. You're, you're really deviating from the normal mindset of I need to play what's on the printed page. And so that leap of faith into something new is actually for me what unlocked and unleashed something that I didn't even know was in me. So maybe you like it, maybe you don't. I, I have no claims to, you know, this is the greatest music in the world. But what it did was it, it gave me a quantum leap over from where I was to this new form that really I could play on my strengths with and I could really play with literally. And so um, how that ties into the, the brand world and sort of my, my overall career arc is that there were a number of times that both you know, situations, life, divorce, single motherhood, you know, where I really had to take these leaps of faith as to, can I do this? I don't know if I can do this. Can I, you know, that the whole questioning of the self and self-confidence and try something new. And am I going to be able to do this? And, and, but still bringing the, um, I had a, a teacher a long time ago who was very adamant about cross training. So what that meant was know your strengths, know your weaknesses, and be willing to cross-train your weaknesses so that you can bring them up as strengths. And if you're trying something new, you know, try that, take all your skills, all your talents, all your abilities, and just place them into something new and see how you do. But of course, with with the mindset of a beginner. And I think that makes all the difference in the world. You know, that's something that has really served me well in terms of choices in in my, my career, especially in these last several years. And so how does that play over in the work you're doing with brand, brand storytelling, especially for purpose-driven brands that are trying to make an impact in the world? Yeah, well, so so that was another part of, you know, experience that was happening and again, kind of tapping into what feels right, what doesn't feel right. So I started, I, I'll be honest with you, I started to have some ethical questions in terms of some of the projects I was working on for some larger companies. And it was enough that made me question, do I really personally want to be involved with this? So not just selling something for selling it something safe. Exactly. You're, you're helping them brand maybe a product or service that you don't believe in. Exactly. And, you know, what, what 
consequence does that have to, to be a part of that process? Something I don't believe in, or, or there's, you know, something that's really um, niggling at me in terms of the ethical part of it. And so what that did was that it, it made me reframe who am I working with? So, so that first wave of the dot coms was really fun for me because I was really passionate about that. I was really passionate about that industry and, you know, what can we do and what are the, the possibilities? And, you know, as time has evolved, what's happened and, and since when really it kind of started when you and I started working together, the whole realm of sustainability and social impact. And is there this greater purpose that I'm, I'm helping get out there and helping to be a part of the process, helping train people, tell better stories, create better brands, market more clearly, market in a way that actually engages real people instead of purely data driven. That is what has become very passionate for me now. So I have a framework to take all this past experience and past skills and put it into things that I, I really believe in and projects I really believe in. Yeah, now you are teaching at Arizona State University, the Executive Masters for Sustainability Leadership, uh, a program that I was very fortunate and helped starting many years ago. And I, I worked there for five years on it and I needed to exit. And they said, well, who will take your place? And I thought to myself, well, Alicia, she would be perfect. And you were already training the online version of the course and us having worked together for so long that, that you kind of understood the direction, but then you brought your own unique style and talents to it. So what are you doing this day and age? You're working with uh, executives to help them make a greater impact and you're teaching in a couple of other places. So yes. where are you now in your career? Yeah, so most days I tell people I'm in many places, but the main places I'm at is that I am teaching for the School of Sustainability. And so, you know, it, thanks to our, our connections uh, with you and I, that led me into teaching for the first time for higher education. I always thought, who me? I can't do that. And I remember the day you came to my office and asked, would you at all have any interest in this? I could, you know, submit you for it as part of that, that selection process. And I remember at the time thinking, that'd be so cool. And at the same breath, oh my gosh, that's terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> Improvisation once again. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And, and so I obviously I said, yes, uh, I teach for the Master's of Sustainability Leadership Program, which is a purely online program through ASU. It's a master's degree in sustainability leadership. And that's what I'm teaching is the storytelling and the communications end of this. How do you use storytelling for leadership purposes, not just to tell better stories, but emotional intelligence, cross-cultural communication? How do you work with stakeholders? How do you meet people where they are, especially when you talk about topics like sustainability, where some one person may say, what's that in terms of that word? And the next person may say, I, I, I love that, and I work with the government doing all this stuff, right? There's a bunch of variations in between in terms of people's knowledge. But essentially, I do that. I do the Executive Masters of Sustainability Leadership. Uh, which is a hybrid program, and we get to go to a couple places and, and meet our, our students in person. And then I teach over at Benedictine University in Mesa, and that is a, a private liberal arts college, and I do marketing and entrepreneurship. And so I get to work with 18, roughly 18 to 24-year-olds. And for me, that's a, that's a real pleasure. I think that's when I really realized I actually really like teaching because um, I get to give back. You know, that's, that's, I get to touch a bunch of people who are young people who are just starting out for the first time. Yeah. Well, that's exactly right. And you can have that kind of impact to help them not steer their career, but help them find their career. Much like the harp and the in branding found you to share with them, you know, your insights on this teaching. They've got an interest, obviously, because they're enrolled in your course, but help them find their way. I know how powerful and rewarding that is. I want to ask you, because you've got such a background in brand communication, and let's start with first thinking brand communication, brand naming, because when you and I both got in this business, that's what it was. Storytelling was not a thing. What do you think? What is your definition or the difference between brand communication and brand storytelling? Ooh, that's a loaded question. <laughs> I think it's going to, I mean, I'll be real. It's got to be answered within the eye of the beholder. So I'm one of these people because I came from the world of brand development that I'm constantly poking holes in these terms. And, and so, you know, brand development is what it sounds like. It's developing a brand before it gets out to marketing 
marketing and advertising and all the rest of it. But I can make an argument that through the positioning and through the verbal identity and through the visual identity that these in and of itself are very telegraphed in some ways, even working with the subliminal mind in terms of what is the brand communication, what is the brand story in a very, I, I always use the term kind of telegraphed way, right? Because you only have a few seconds to, to tell a story with a few words, some colors, some symbols, and that's what we take in as Nike. That's what we take in as Apple in terms of that brand identity. And the question is really, are you telling a story or is that just a symbol of a, of a deeper underlying brand narrative that the brand has created through a lot of other mediums? It is absolutely a symbol. And I think it's, it's like an anchor point to creating a richer dimensionality, to creating, we hope, more authenticity too. So I, I believe the brand itself is very, very important to anchoring those greater stories through the different mediums. And, you know, we're, we're, the amount of technology that has changed over the last 20 years in terms of what we use for marketing and advertising is, is kind of staggering. You, you really stand back and, and take a look at all, all of it. But when it comes down to the simple fact that a brand is the anchor to all of your storytelling and all of your communications and the channels that you're using to tell that story. The only thing we're doing with the channels, in my opinion, is we're looking at where are our audiences? How do they use those channels? Am I going to reach that person in terms of demographics and psychographics and consumer behavior because they use that channel or not? So for example, if I'm trying to reach an 18-year-old on Snapchat, well, I'm obviously not gonna be using Facebook to be reaching that 18-year-old, that right? And then how do you play with the rules of engagement and the boundaries of creativity is the other thing I'm going to say in terms of what that channel has to offer. So of course my approach to Snapchat or to Instagram is going to be very different than a print ad or an interrupter screen that is some kind of an ad that's going across, you know, Google on a mobile phone. So this is kind of a convoluted way of saying some things in terms of that brand story, the anchor of that story of what is that story has to be very consistent across all of these different channels and how you tell that story in, in terms of the execution of it and the implementation of it. That's what's really interesting because you can start to get really creative. If, if the difference between, uh, you know, as you know, you know, like a, a seven second video and uh, a um, three minute, which in this, this world would be considered a very long form video is going to be very different. You know, how I'm going to verbally, visually, strategically, and co communication-wise execute that. Well, in, I think Instagram does not do storytelling any favors when they call you know, their, their app the, the story, Instagram stories because nobody actually tells a story on there. All they do is bombard you with slide after scene after video of just blah content, which just confuses our brain. Nobody actually tells a story, and in my definition, is set up problem resolution. You have to have three acts. Something has to happen, which you can do on Instagram, but nobody does. And so they're not really stories. It's just more noise, visual audio noise coming at you to compete with. And it feels like when some when you actually take the time to tell a story of here's what I'm attempting to do and oh my God, this fell apart or here's what we tried to do, but here's the hole we got ourselves in and here's how we came out of it. Those are the kinds of stories and I think National Geographic does a really nice job with that sort of thing. But they are thinking as intentional storytellers, not just using story as the soup du jour term that we hear it being used at today. I so agree with you. And it's funny you mentioned National Geographic because that's who I was going to bring up as a good example of storytelling, even on Instagram. Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, you have to go back and look that. Look, number one, they actually fund storytelling. They, they literally fund storytellers. You can get a grant to go do visual storytelling with National Geographic as one of their explorers. This is intentionally baked into their business strategy. It's intentionally baked into their research strategy because they have learned for the positive that visual storytelling is hugely, hugely important to, to telling a story. And they also understand the power of cross-pollinization across channels. You know, and so I, you know, I love National Geographic and I love following. They're one of my favorite channels to follow on, 
on Instagram because they, they understand that. And of course, the photography is, is just incredible and always has been. And that's the power, as we know, of Instagram. It's really about a photo. But then it's like, you know, this is, I think, where people can get too rigid in their thinking. And, and I've met a lot of people in business say, oh, you know, that channel, insert this channel's name here. Oh, it's just so limiting and I can't do this. And all they're doing is they're complaining about it. And I'm sitting there going, so why can't you break some of the rules? You know, why can't you do some, is, is there an opportunity and what are the opportunities to take advantage of that story on Instagram? And how do I create a three act structure that actually has some kind of a conflict and a resolution? And it's, it's going through and what, 10 seconds, right? How can I harness IGTV, for example, which is the, the longer form format of video on Instagram that, you know, it's, ga it's gaining, it's gaining in, in adoption and um, viewership for it. How can I harness that for greater storytelling? And then how can I cross pollinate that even within the Instagram platform? And so, you know, I think there are a lot more opportunities than limitations when we look at, at social media, when it comes to actually telling that story in a way that's meaningful and mm -hmm. in a way that resonates. So let me ask you, let's shift gears a little, a little bit. And I'm sitting across from you at the table and I've got a brand, it, you know, I believe it's a purpose-driven brand and I want to have impact for good in the world. And I'm trying to find my way in my branding, brand communications and storytelling. What is some of the initial guidance you give to someone like that? Well, you know, when, it depends on what they're looking for. So when it comes to um, whether it's brand development or helping to tell bigger stories, the big thing is really always backing up to the positioning. So this is this is a whole, you know this well because you're a strategist as well, but a lot of people don't actually realize that you you can't build a house that is really cool looking and modern looking and sleek looking that the Joneses over there are going to envy if it's built on sticks and with no foundation and it becomes like the three little pigs house it just blows down and if you want to make the analogy brand positioning in other words how a brand it doesn't matter what the brand is is positioned in the marketplace how it's unique how it's relevant how it is the same for that matter as your competitors what are the values behind it now see what's really honestly changed and this is going down to just even consumer preferences is that we've got millennials and down who actually care is there a purpose to this brand and what is it and can I get behind that am I, am I going to vote with my pocketbook you know that way and support this brand so so we've got that shift as well and so you know when when I'm talking to people and it really doesn't matter what their brand is is it a company is it a product is it a service a social venture a nonprofit? that's where we start is what do you think that positioning is and we walk through different exercises to assess that, assess the competition. How are you unique? Are we articulating that clearly? Are your values coming through? Are they not coming through? What is the mission? I'm, I'm finding that more and more people have a hard time distinguishing between mission and vision. And so, you know, mission is essentially what are you doing now? Vision is where, what do you aspire to be along with what you're doing now? Those are concepts that Back to discipline, a lot of people in business and, and even on the NGO side of it don't necessarily have the discipline to go and do that. They want to go straight to the sexy communications campaigns and ad campaigns. Make it cool. <laughs> yeah, make it cool. Make it slick. And, and it's really seductive to just jump over that. Say, yeah, we don't need that. We can just go. Yeah. But you do. Well, how often, and I see this uh, quite often in my work too, is when you sit down and ask a brand, what do they believe in value? They have a hard time articulating it. It's not that they don't have beliefs and values. They just haven't done the heavy lifting of unearthing those yet. And I do this simple exercise now, and it's new since you worked with me back in the day, and I call it the OO exercise, O-O-O-H. And the three O's stand for organization, offering, and outcome. And what I ask them to do when they're you know, trying to figure out who they are, what they stand for, and what they believe in value, is I say find three one-word descriptors for each one of those silos. So describe your organization in three words. Describe your offering in three words and describe the outcomes or the customer engagement. What are you actually making happen in the world versus just what you make 
in three words. And then I asked them to go and find true stories about real people that have experienced each one of these words, using each word as a theme for that story. They come back, and if you know, you've got several people sitting around the table, you end up with 20 or 30 stories that they start sharing with each other. And coming out of those stories, you see these beliefs and values. They kind of materialize before their very eyes. And then they realize, oh, you know, yes, I've always thought that. I've just never articulated it. But I find that that's a really powerful way to start building a storytelling culture within a brand while they do their own self-discovery using these true stories about really what they're making happen in the world. I think that's great. And it's a great approach to doing it that way because you got a couple things going on. You're, you're looking at, number one, I mean, brevity is the bane of everybody's existence today, <laughs> yeah. right? Trying to get somebody to center around three words that actually align with anything, let alone your brand, is a big ask. So, you know, any, anytime there's an opportunity to go cross-pollinate that with what are other people thinking? What are they experiencing more, more accurately? And bring that back in. And, and it's, it's the old, um, you know, in, in the startup world, when we're talking about the lean model, there's always this adage of get out of the building. Stop talking to yourself. Stop talking to your, your, your business mates. Get out of the freaking building and go talk to your actual customers. Go ask to actually talk to the people you want to be your customers and start to cross-pollinate that in as inputs into what you think or what you think you think, because a lot of times we're wrong. Big surprise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, that, that social validation and, and you know, cross-pollinization of the customer and target customer inputs, hugely valuable. And, the, and I'm, I mean, I don't use that exercise, obviously, but you know, that is in alignment with what I do in terms of making sure that people are actually validating their ideas out there. Yeah. So you teaching in the School of Sustainability, and you had mentioned earlier, it's still this amorphous term. A lot of people just don't understand what sustainability is. And I totally get that. And of course, you've got climate deniers and you've got people say, why do we need to change? How do you use story, again, working with brands that want to make an impact in the world to maybe you know overcome some of those uh, views, find common ground, and actually move the needle, help these people actually have an impact? Yeah, well, you know, when it comes to the academic side, I'm actually focused a little less on the external communications and external marketing, although obviously it gets brought in in, in different realms. A lot of the emphasis is actually, because this is about leadership and leadership within organizations, it's about how do you empower people to tell a story with what is traditionally considered dry facts? So, you know, just for the, the, the sake of everyone listening, um, when we're talking about sustainability, we're talking about three pillars, environmental, social, economic. It is not tree hugging. It is not just about climate change. It's everything from what we, we talk about with social justice to energy justice to zero waste to circular economy. There's a number of different terms and, and business practices out there that are gaining in popularity that are being researched and explored more, that startups are focusing on, and they're being placed within this umbrella of sustainability. And so, you know, when you're trying to convey to someone who is in an organization, and now I'm, I am Ms. Sustainability Quote Leader, I have uh, a mission to create an, an initiative that's going to take, uh, perhaps it is taking my, my company more to a circular economy model. That would be a really honestly big ask for a lot of, of big companies, but we also know that there's some great companies out there who are moving that way, even in, in small incremental steps. And so one of the things that, that I'm working with people on is that how do you take this idea of an initiative and not a go all John Wayne on it? You're not the, you're not the Lone Ranger. You're not the, I'm the new sheriff and this is how it's going to be. That We all know that's not reality. We have to build coalitions. We have to find stakeholders and we have to, Create these alliances with people who are both for what we're doing and maybe kind of a frenemy in a sense of we need to understand where they're coming from. You know, well, so how come they're not for this? Why wouldn't this be a good idea for a secular economy within our, our organization? And so storytelling is not, I think that's one of the misnomers of the myths with storytelling that it's all about external. It's all about brand centric and Facebook and, and marketing. A lot of our storytelling begins inside of organizations. And so if I have this idea of initiative, how do I take that three-act 
universal story structure and break it down to here's the situation, here are the problems and conflicts, here are some potential solutions, whether that's one or many. What do we have now? What could there be in the future? How can we imagine something a little bit different from that? And that in and of itself is, first of all, learnable. You can learn how to do that. Even with a PowerPoint presentation, you can learn how to do that. Well, the, matter, the fact of the matter is it's innate in us. Absolutely. You know, we already know this stuff. We just need to be intentional about it. So Absolutely. you're right. So, but use these structures and use these frameworks to your advantage. Well, and here's the other thing you have to use to your advantage is I always go back to Aristotle's three appeals. Okay, so we have ethos, and that that's our credibility. And a lot of in the Western world, we look at ethos as our what are the acronyms at the end of our name, and then you've got logos, and that's the logic, and that's the logical mind, and that's where we come up with our facts. So this is the facts of what you need to know, and this is why we should do that. Well, most of of the the Western approach to decision making is based off of ethos and logos, but then you've got pathos, and pathos. Aristotle said back in the day, well, if you're really going to be persuasive and persuade a person and persuade a person with your communication and storytelling, you've got to do it from the heart. And that's what pathos means, is heart. So, you know, we have essentially as business people forgotten and, and as scientists and as government people that no matter who we're dealing with, we're dealing with human beings. And it's a one-on-one -on -one relationship. And unless you're building empathy, and unless you're willing to be authentic, and unless you're willing to be a little bit vulnerable in making that very human connection with the person or group of people, that really, that's the, that's the secret sauce. You got, you got to be in the Venn diagram, you know, the ethos, locus, and pathos. And then when we're talking about actual storytelling, look, if you're telling a story, and this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened, our eyes glaze over. I always ask people, what do you remember from your 10th grade geometry class? And if we're lucky, we get Pythagorean's theorem, right? The rest is complete fuzz, complete noise. Why? Because we're not wired for that. We're not wired for those facts. And so we are. We know neuroscience is backed up. And, and I, you used to teach this too. You know, it's like neuroscience has firmly validated that our brains are wired for story. And that's how it goes back from the beginning of time. We didn't learn through the instruction manual. We didn't learn through a textbook on how to survive from the tribe over there and the bear over there. It was all told through story and allegory. Why? Because we can remember that. And why? Because we're putting it back within the context of humanity, of humans, and the senses. And so when we're telling impactful stories, the why the purpose, yes, but then in the execution, we're building on those senses. We're building on the visual and the hearing and the sight and the sound. And, and there is a wonderful study that was done by some researchers in Spain, and they, they, they mapped this with the brain. And so they, they wanted to see if I say certain words that are fact-driven, what would happen in the brain? And they figured out that the Broca area of the brain will actually register those facts and, and they kind of go in and out. It's very neutral. That's why we forget a lot of facts, you know, like from 10th grade geometry or from eighth grade social sciences, something like that. But there's another area of the brain that gets completely lit up and, and it's, it's multiple areas of the brain, I should really say. And that's when we say very evocative words. So for example, if I say to you, cinnamon, lavender, soap, all of you should have some type of a sense memory that is around the touch, the feel, the smell, the taste, even with soap for those who are adventurous children. And, and that's because those words are, are evocative. They're, they're, they're picking up on different aspects of the brain that, that actually spark our sense memory. And when, when it comes to good storytelling, I mean, A, that's one of the reasons why a good book is hard to put down. I mean, if you think about it, dead carbon, it's dead carbon in our hands. But why is it that that, that story is so illicit? And I, I'm just like, oh my gosh, I can't put this down. And I'm still dreaming about it even when I finish the story. That whole sense of evocative imagery, sound to your advantage, anything that, that, that sparks that sense memory within a human is truly one of the keys to execution of good story. And of course, you can't do that without the whys, and you can't do that without the purpose, and you can't do that without the structure. So all of these things work really well hand in hand. And most people think this is just about the movies, and it's about Hollywood. But you can take any 
presentation and an organization and put this together in, with the with this format and it actually works and it's not going to be hokey it, it really does work why because we're appealing human to human not just facts that are going to go in one ear and out the other one of the challenges and i'm sure you experience this too in teaching in the executive master's program is you're teaching executives people that from around the world that have a lot of experience in some cases and while they want to lead, you know, bring more significance to their career through becoming a leadership and sustainability, they are trapped in that logic mindset. How have you found or do you have some tricks to get people? And if you're a listener out there and you feel like, oh, that all sounds well and good and because you two are professional storytellers and musicians and you're in touch with your feelings and emotions, what would you advise listeners who feel like they can't get there? to put that aside like you did, it become more improvisational and start embracing some of this emotional side of communication so that they can have a bigger impact, but they got to have the guts to do it. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm laughing over here because of the, the, the whole touchy feely, so airy fairy, so emotional. Woo, woo, woo. I've heard it all, trust me. <laughs> yeah, woo, woo. So one of the one of the very interesting things about being in this program is that we have had a number of career military who have retired. These are officers even who come out of the military and they come through our program at ASU. And I was just having this conversation this morning, in fact, with a with the army colonel. And uh, one of the, the the big challenges for folks who come out of the military is the actual permission to ask questions the actual permission to lower down and be willing to be vulnerable in terms of I am now going to have a authentic conversation with you. I may not have all the answers. There is no direct yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, yes, sir, no, sir. I may have no answers for you, and I'm going to own up to that. And that sense of being just willing, okay, nothing else, being willing to be vulnerable to be authentic, to identify that empathy really is the key to relationships and, and cooperation for that matter. When people can visually and viscerally experience that, what I've noticed is that they become more and more willing to take chances and to trust a little bit more in the process of what they're doing. So that's sort of an airy-fairy way of saying <laughs> that it takes willingness number one. It just takes one. You got to be open to it. You've got to be open to it. And, and so, you know, I, I'm, I'm telling all of you, you have permission to do that because if you do that, you actually become more authentic, credible. People want to listen to you a little bit more. And what happens is that, oh, side benefit, people become more amenable to helping you with what it is that you're trying to achieve and what that goal is and what that higher purpose is. Yeah, you actually and beckon yeah. them into your story and they become exactly. an active participant in your story. And isn't that really what we're all about? We want people to buy into the stories that we're sharing with them. Well, and you know, we, we need people to to support the stories because, you know, for anybody who's seen anything, it seems like there's one person on the screen making all of the, who is the focus of the story and who is the hero, but there's a cast of characters around that person, right? They are not the actual hero. In, in the creation of that, that movie, you have this team of people who have been helping on all ends from the set to the post-production, to the marketing, to the accounting, to the, you name it. And so the long story short here is there is no I, it is the we, <laughs> it is, you know, it's, it's the old cliche. This is all about we. Well, if you've been listening to this show, you've heard me say over and over and over again that you as the storyteller are not the center of the story. Your Absolutely. audience is the hero in this journey. You are telling a story that they can relate to from their point of view. And you actually play a more important role, I might argue, of the mentor or guide. You are there to help them achieve what they want out of life and to you know, weave that into what you're trying to get out of life. And you win together that way. But you place them at the center of your story. Absolutely. And, you know, it's been for, for a number of years now, but it, it's, it's that much more crystallized in terms of what my purpose is. And my purpose is actually not about me. My purpose is about empowering a lot of people who are doing good, who are affecting change, who are working within that sustainability framework 
to create ethical systems thinking, guided outcomes that are going to have positive impacts in the world. Not just now, but let's, you know, take it into, I, I love the Native American, especially the Eastern tribes who always talk about the seven generations, you know, mm -hmm. if we make decisions now, how is that going to affect seven generations from now? And that's a thing, that's a, a mode of thinking that is very foreign to a lot of Westerners. And I do believe that that is where we're at in time, you know, politically, economically, socially, technologically, we were at that point in time where we need to be thinking that way. So anybody that I can help empower to have a, a forward movement within that, that's my mission. And you are continuing your growth in that area as you are now pursuing your PhD in human and social dimensions of science and technology. Yes. What's that about? <laughs> so I have decided that I liked teaching so much, I actually want to obtain the additional credentials for that. And I am actually getting, as a now as a doctoral student, I'm getting my first foray and taste into research that are associated with that. So I am, as you said, and for short, we say HSD, so I'll just make it painless on people. But we have a school here at ASU called the School for the Future of Innovation in Society. And we're focused on science and technologies and how we shape the future and how that comes back to human and social policies, outcomes, dimensions, inputs, the, the whole nine yards. And so personally, what I'm doing is that I'm very, very interested in empowering younger people who have not been traditionally represented, whether it's from ethnographics or socioeconomics, and to bring them more to the table in terms of understanding that they have choices in terms of technology and sustainability and social impact and all these different realms of uh, career choices that are out there, number one. Higher ed may be a part of that. Higher ed may not be a part of that. And, and so what choices do they have? So essentially, I'm looking at how can we create new frameworks for leadership, for redefining what STEAM is, when that STEAM is science, technology, engineering, arts, and that's the, the missing part of the STEM part, and math and putting those together, but also infusing that with new meanings, meaning sustainability and social impact and entrepreneurship and emotional intelligence, ooh, a very key part of communications and leadership. And, and bringing these together in a scalable, replicable program that can go for, for certain communities. And so I have a few communities that I hope to be working with in the next couple of years here and doing some research projects to see can we get there and can we create something. Um, but the but the overall impact of this is that it's all about affecting positive change in the future and allowing the storytelling in particular to be a tool and to be an enabler of these people who represent their community to take their storytelling into their community and see to lead that way because the outside in never works. And the whole, I'm going to go save as an American, I'm going to go save the planet or go save Africa or go save, you know, fill in the blank here is, is an illusion. So what we really need is powerful people who can tell stories as leaders within their own communities. And you made my point for me. You are becoming that storytelling mentor through your studies, through your actions, through your activity, through your brand background, and through your work as a musician to be able to really understand and touch people and improvise all along the way as you go, right? So there are no rigid forms to it, but just to be yourself and to get out there and make the impact that you can possibly make in the world by following your own story. Absolutely. And if I have one piece of advice for anyone, it is be willing to be authentic, be yourself and go for it. <laughs> go for broke. Alicia, thank you so much for being with us today. You have a ton on your plate and I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. Where can people learn more about you and your great work? Yeah, well, they can connect with me on LinkedIn, Alicia DeMesa, and you can see what my training and advisory group is doing. And that's at demesa7.com. And you've got a new book coming out in early 2020. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, so that's under development and we're shooting for 2020. We hope it's at the beginning of okay. 2020. Yes. And that is all going to be about storytelling itself and leadership within storytelling. Terrific. Well, thank you so much for being here. So great to connect with you again right here on The Business of Story. Thank you. And thank you for all listening to this edition. If you like what you heard, 
and who wouldn't? And you've got some friends, family members, colleagues that you feel would benefit from Alicia's advice, especially on how to find that authentic voice to tell your story. Well, by all means, please share this episode with them. We appreciate it and it helps expand our audience in the process. And of course, if I can be of service to you, visit me over at thebusinessofstory.com where I have many, 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 well, like a couple hundred story artists like Alicia that we've been interviewing over the past four years. I'm very proud to say that The Business of Story is now among the top 10% of downloaded podcasts in the world. And it's taken a lot of effort, but it's all about sharing great stories like you heard today and helping you craft and tell compelling stories that sell. So feel free to share this podcast with your world. And until next week, remember that the most potent story you will ever tell is the story you tell yourself. So make it a great one. Thanks for listening.